Brasília, a capital que, por meio de suas linhas modernistas, traçou o futuro de um país de dimensões continentais e enfrentou o grande desafio de integrar norte, sul, leste e oeste no desenho de uma sociedade mais justa, democrática e igualitária. Bem-vindos ao Brasil. Ficção científica do passado, capital das águas, quadradinho, avião, Reconhecida por vários nomes, esta cidade criada para ser a morada de uma burocracia que se alternava no tempo, um não lugar, cedeu aos afetos e se transformou em lá nas mãos de seus habitantes e nas gerações que ali se desenvolveram. Gostaríamos de tê-los aqui conosco, compartilhando das belezas de nosso céu, de nossas águas, de nossa cultura, de nossa gastronomia e de nossa gente. Porém, os desafios trazidos pelo momento crítico que o nosso planeta enfrenta nos impedem de vivenciar esses momentos com vocês. Mais de uma coisa podemos ter certeza. Se a pandemia de Covid-19 nos afasta fisicamente, ela também nos aproxima ao nos fazer relembrar de que os desafios que a humanidade enfrenta necessitam ser enfrentados conjuntamente, reconhecendo que todos nós compartilhamos de uma condição que nos faz humanos. Se por um lado não estamos juntos, por outro nunca estivemos mais próximos em nossas preocupações e necessidades. Vamos juntos avançar sobre os problemas globais que se impõem. Vamos juntos construir democracias melhores, mais transparentes, mais responsáveis e mais participativas. Sejam bem-vindos à Conferência Internacional de Comissários de Acesso à Informação 2021. Welcome to the first of the ICIC's 2021 Open Session Webinars. These digital sessions will allow us to collaborate and benefit from our shared wisdom, while circumstances unfortunately prevent us from meeting in person. It's a little different than previous years, but I think we've all become familiar with change recently. 2020 brought unprecedented challenges for, all, for us all. And change was so fast and so sudden that it made people unsure, nervous, and even afraid. And that's one of the reasons why our work is so important. The right to access the information can help people make sense of those changes, and that is fundamental. Decisions about public health and civil liberties, about where we can travel, who we can see, about vaccines and testing, about supporting and reshaping whole economies. It's through transparency, and explaining those decisions that people can get to understand them and trust them. The duty to document decisions is so important here too. Once attention turns to the inevitable public inquiries and what lessons can be learned from the management of the pandemic, it will be vital that decision-making has been properly documented. Without transparency, trust is lost. And our community's role here has been essential in supporting those rights and in using our voices to reiterate their importance. And when the information being requested is so high profile, potentially so controversial, it's easy to forget, perhaps, the fundamental principles that underpin our role as commissioners of independence or of fully informed decision-making and of consistent judgments rooted in law. We should be proud of the work that we have done.
And now our community, our combined expertise and experience can turn to the challenges that come next. We can consider transparency by design and the continued impact of the pandemic. The balance between privacy and health information disclosure. We can consider how our work interacts with freedom of the press, with state secrecy, and with data protection. And we can look ahead to the challenges approaching on the horizon, such as the use of artificial intelligence. Throughout these discussions, we must focus on pragmatism over philosophy. We must ask ourselves time and time again, what changes can we make that will make access to information easier and more available to our citizens? The ICIC is the forum to answer that question. And our group has become the focal point for our community with a truly global membership. The ICIC's value has been demonstrated over the past year as a place to collaborate, as a forum to discuss challenges and share solutions, and as a mechanism for our community to speak with one voice on key issues. Our joint statement on access to information during the pandemic and the duty to document decisions are good examples of our work. And always with a focus on practical steps that can make a real impact on people's lives. This year's open session will be a series of webinars and workshops. And I'm very thankful to Minister Rosario of the C CGU in Brazil for his and his team's hard work in organizing these events and also allowing the ICIC's good work to continue. I look forward to the seminars and the workshops and seeing the progress that we can make. Thank you. Dear Elizabeth Dunham, thank you very much for your opening words. In your person, I would like to congratulate the Information Commissioner's Office for all the support given to the holding of this conference, as well as to recognize the fundamental role that this institution has played and plays in the consolidation of this network, both in the role of its chair and the role of its secretary. It's thanks to this dedication and support that today I can begin this speech by announcing, dear fellow commissioners, welcome to the International Conference of Information Commissioners. Fate determined that Brazil would host the seek precisely in the year that the Brazil Access to Information Law completes a decade since its publication. It's true that the reasons that led us to not hold this conference in 2020 are not worth celebrating, but you have no way of not making a note about this good coincidence. We live in a unique moment in the recent history of mankind, and with the rep re representative dynamic that has sustained democracy over the last, the last centuries gains new contours, driven by the expansion of data and information flows which overlap geographic distance and impose a new time. The principle and agent logic, which usually was tested only in specific time windows, is now tested live. Social control, which was carried out only by large vehicles and had the means and the privileges to access state information is now dispersed in society, which manifested in digital media, the new arena of a political debate. This reality imposes on governments an extensive set of challenges, 
which begin with developing a capacity for effective and timely response to the desires of society, a public that increasingly demands the conformation of real time to the immediate experience of virtual space. At the same time, state institutions which have built their reputation in an environment with a less developed flow of information find themselves in, a, in an urgent need to readapt themselves, adopt increasingly robust standards of integrity, develop more efficient mechanisms of accountability and manage new risks. Here, we cannot fail to make a brief note of the growing need for states to provide means for the expansion of information literacy, as, per, as perhaps one of the most important measures to ensure the longevity of our democratic systems. In a world that's expo exponentially digitized, information literacy becomes a prerequisite for the effective exercise of the right to know, for which the right of ac access to information is an essential instrument, instrument for knowledge, for democracy, and for the exercise of the most basic rights guaranteed to our population. It's important to remember that the urgency of guarantee, the means for the effective exercise of rights vis-à-vis -vis the state has never been felt so globally, so globally and urgently. While states are struggling to combat a pandemic that's plaguing all continents, our population needs to have the necessary information to guarantee the maintenance of income, health and education. It is in this critical and volatile environment that state information, complete and authentic, needs to reach everyone. The challenge is not small, it's a cultural challenge, and that is precis precisely why it cannot be treated as if its solution depends only on one institution. The challenge is for democratic institutions as a whole and can only be met through collaboration between state institutions, academic and civil society. They seek represents precisely this ecosystem, which, in the words of the Johannesburg Charter, connects member information commissioners in order to foster the protection and the promotions of access to public information as a fundamental pillar to social, economic and democratic governance. Precisely in order to keep all of us connected, this is sick 2021, bets on continuity, extend to actions that start today in progress throughout this year in eight open sessions, three workshops, a meeting, a meeting with civil societies, a closed session of commissioners and a call for papers with the first SIC technical journal to be launched within the first months of 2022. As you can see, we are striving to keep the spirit of this network alive. And it is in, in this spirit of collaboration and joint growth that I am pleased to call Professor Toby Mendel, who is a red no to many of you and who played a fundamental role for CGU itself when this institution faced the challenge to take the first steps towards the implementation of the Access to Information Law in Brazil almost a decade ago. Therefore, it's also expressing our thanks to Tob and to all the mediators and panelists that will make this SIC 2021 happen. That I welcome the first mediator of our conference and give him the floor to conduct our panel on transparency and trust in pandemic times. I wish you all a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Minister, and uh, welcome everyone to the first webinar of the 12th uh, International uh, Commissioner's Information Conference. It's uh, my great pleasure to moderate uh, this panel. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the Center for Law and Democracy. It's a human rights organization based in Canada, uh, and we uh, do a lot of work on access to information, the legislation and implementation of, of the legislation. Um, as the minister suggested, I have uh, followed the, the ICIC for quite some time. I can't say I've been to all 12 of the conferences, but I've certainly been uh, to more than half of them. 
Uh, the topic we have before us today is a complex one. Um, transparency, like many social goods, uh, was negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I would say, arguably, it was more hard hit than many uh, of the social goods that we, we previously enjoyed, um, whether through neglect by governments or, in some cases, governments taking advantage of the pandemic uh, uh, to clam up and to be less open. Um, my organization has argued from the very beginning of the pandemic that RTI was an essential service, something that needed to be maintained, even possibly extended during the pandemic and not to be uh, deprioritized. And there were two reasons that we uh, made that argument. Firstly, uh, in the wider information infodemic, as the, as the pandemic was uh, alternately styled um, by the WHO, the right to information, uh, whether through proactive disclosure of information or response to requests for information, uh, could quite literally uh, be a matter of life and death. And I think Elizabeth and her comments uh, highlighted some of the, the, the ways in which access to information was, was of even more fundamental importance during the pandemic pandemic uh, than otherwise. And the second reason was that uh, during this unprecedented times, uh, governments were making utterly momentous decisions, uh, uh, you know, faster and with less uh, debate and less social accountability than ever before. Uh, many accountability mechanisms were on their knees uh, and the right to information needed to be one of the mechanisms, one of the ways uh, in which accountability could be maintained. So we, we argued that it was not a, not a something to uh, second place in the pandemic, but something which might, must be front and, and, and center of the actual response to the pandemic. Okay, I'll stop with those uh, introductory comments and uh, we'll move on to our panelists. Um, I will introduce them uh, one by one. I'm going to only introduce them briefly. Uh, more information about them is, is online if, if you're interested. And uh, we're going to start with Amy. Uh, she's the research manager at Freedom House. Uh, she oversees their flagship uh, publication. Uh, many of you will be aware of it, Freedom in the World. And she's recently responsible for uh, co-authoring a report, uh, Democracy Under Law. Lockdown, which looks at democracy uh, in the time of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, Amy, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Toby. Um, and thank you to the ICIC and CGU for having me, as well as to my fellow panelists. Um, so since the coronavirus broke out early last year, Freedom House has analyzed how the pandemic is impacting democracy and human rights. And we've done this through our annual reports, including Freedom in the World, and through our October report, Democracy Under Lockdown. For the latter report, we surveyed around 400 democracy and human rights experts in order to determine how democracy worldwide has been impacted by the pandemic. So based on this survey, as well as other research we've done, Perhaps not surprisingly, we found that the pandemic has really exacerbated existing declines in democracy worldwide. And a common theme that kept cropping up, as well as a major reason for this further decline, is the undermining or breakdown of transparency in countries around the world. So this is happening across all regime types, from established democracies to highly repressive states. So based on this survey that we um, sent out, lack of transparency in COVID information was a top concern. So 37% of the respondents um, said that lack of transparency and official information ranked highest among 15 issues most affected by the pandemic. And of course, lack of transparency leads to a lack of trust. So 62% of the respondents said that they distrust pandemic related information from the government in their country. I would note that this is also not happening only at the national level. So a bit over half of the respondents said they distrusted information coming from local governments. So these survey results were really backed up by our latest Freedom in the World report, which assesses 210 countries and territories, political rights and civil liberties every year. And that includes um, government transparency. We actually found that transparency was one of the hardest hit areas of government's COVID response. This came after disproportionate or discriminatory limits on freedoms of movement and assembly. 
So this lack of transparency has manifested in various ways. One is that many government actors have actively pushed out false or misleading information. So for example, state leaders and politicians have falsely claimed to have the virus under control. This has been done also by manipulating COVID data. Others have promoted treatments that turned out to be ineffective or even dangerous. And um, state leaders and politicians have also falsely claimed um, um, or have cast doubt on the origins of the virus or misled people about the degree of harm that the virus could cause. And then there's a handful that have even denied the existence of the virus within their country altogether. At the same time, uh, the spread of false and misleading information has sometimes had the goal of drowning out accurate content about the pandemic uh, to distract the public from ineffective policy responses and to scapegoat certain ethnic and religious communities. Um, this also has a real element to freedom of expression as well. So authorities have censored websites and social media posts in order to suppress unfavorable health statistics, um, to conceal corruption allegations and other COVID related content. And then of course, governments have also suspended access to information requests during their states of emergency. And in some cases, this has prevented the public from accessing crucial health information. Um, they've also awarded pandemic related contracts with fewer controls for transparency. Um, and this has further just undermined the lack of transparency around COVID related information. So the different ways that we've seen transparency decline, of course, have pretty severe consequences. One example, uh, corruption is able to thrive under this environment. But more urgently, of course, lack of transparency and thus lack of trust can seriously undermine people's health and ultimately their lives. Um, I think a major concern at the outset of the pandemic was that restrictions and practices enacted in response to a health crisis would persist long after COVID-19 subsided. In the expert survey, 64% of respondents actually said that the effect of COVID-19 on democracy and human rights in their country would be mostly negative over the next three to five years. So clearly the pandemic isn't just a crisis for democracy now. Uh, the long-term effects can impact everything from government transparency to corruption to the global economy. And COVID-19 is also far from the only global emergency that will exacerbate the democratic decline and seriously challenge transparency efforts. So this should not be treated as a one-off. Rather, advocates for democracy need to be preparing for other emergencies um, based in part on lessons learned from this pandemic and shape their responses in ways that, in that can ensure transparency. This will go a long way towards protecting people's lives. Um, and I'll stop there. I mean, that that was great. I think that's a very um, impressive start to the to the panel. A lot of content there. Um, for me, I, I guess one of the most shocking, although of course not a new. Uh, uh, new information for me was the way that um, some political leaders were were shameless in the way that they abused the situation for political ends, ignoring the underlying uh, health situation, which was, you know, literally killing people uh, by the day. And it's really, I mean, I think it's shocking uh, to, to, to recognize that. Um, our second uh, speaker um, is uh, David. Uh, he's a professor at Queen's University in Canada. Um, his main area of work is on surveillance, and he's published an embarrassingly large number of books uh, on that topic. Uh, but he's also very much an expert on the, the subjects that we're talking about today, uh, transparency and trust in government. Uh, David, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, appreciate being invited to the ICIC and uh, unlike others I have not been directly involved before so it's a privilege for me. So thanks for the invitation. A key issue for post-pandemic times, which I hope will be in soon, is whether or not the massive data use that began in the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic will be ended 
or continued after the pandemic. Many agencies, and not only in public health, wish to retain data that they have been using and to keep on collecting, analyzing, and using it. As Toby says, my chief interest is in questions of surveillance, broadly defined, um, which has grown exponentially during the pandemic. And a key issue, it seems to me, is that this is the first pandemic to break out during surveillance capitalist times. And so, simply put, the relationship between corporation and government has been growing increasingly over the last couple of decades, but has moved forward very rapidly since what is now dubbed, uh, particularly by Shoshana Zuboff, surveillance capitalism. And this raises critical questions for the ways in which we consider transparency, uh, accountability, which is what transparency is for, in order to, uh, in the end, create trust between citizens, governments, and corporations. So as I say, this occurs over several different sectors, new business processes, uh, new innovations, new data sharing between government departments, and the breaking down of traditional silos between government and business. Uh, just one example, uh, on the 12th of May, um, Japan passed through the, uh, the, the diet, uh, a digital, digital agency bill that allows for data linking that occurs right across government and commercial uh, entities, uh, connecting, for example, health and commercial food production, uh, education and income, and so on and so forth. And uh, from what I understand of it, that whole process uh, was pretty lacking in transparency. Also, a, a, another item that is currently on people's agendas is the idea of vaccine passports uh, or green passes. They're given many names, which if they are uh, truly to develop, um, could well affect human rights uh, in places that don't already have one. It could start to uh, contribute to national uh, identification systems through a back door. Uh, it could exacerbate, certainly will exacerbate inequalities, creating two-tier citizenship and so on. And both corporations such as IBM and uh, governments such as New Zealand are already trialing such uh, passes or passports. And so transparency is crucial for that matter, which uh, it will have to become global if it exists at all um, and, and discussed at a global level because it involves tra travel and uh, crossing borders. Governments of many stripes, uh, of whatever stripe, not to mention corporations, frequently wish to guard their secrets. And that idea has been increasing during the pandemic. Uh, I concurred when the um, Elect Front Electronic Frontier Foundation called on governments to be transparent about their arrangements, saying that it's neither uh, healthy for a democracy or normal to hide or classify public health related decisions and deliberations. And yet that's exactly what we have seen since. Many governments have acted in a clandestine fashion, making key decisions behind closed doors or changing legal requirements for matters such as how health data was to be handled, that happened in Canada, and uh, embedding them in other legislation. So this happens in what passes democracies and also in more authoritarian jurisdictions. And not being transparent, of course, leaves ordinary citizens in the dark about what is actually going on. And um, it also disables people's capacity to discuss publicly issues that touch literally their life chances. Public trust in government is crucial to the effective working of digital systems established to counteract the pandemic. This was seen in countries like ta Taiwan, for example, where the government was perceived by citizens as trustworthy. And by the way, thank you, Amy, for that, uh, from comments from the survey. I'm gonna go and look up that thing now because it sounds really helpful. <laughs> 
The global pandemic inspired much welcome innovation and in medical treatment and hospital care, as well in numerous attempts to learn about and check the spread of the virus. The collection and curation of those data were, however, not always accompanied by uh, adequate explanations of how, why, and with what implications these data were being used for profiling and predicting, or what expectations citizens could have about issues such as data protection and privacy. Transparency was frequently lacking and trust was eroded. This happened all over the place. Um, India, case in point, early on, um, once they'd got over it not being a, an emergency, um, they tried to introduce um, uh, a phone app for contact tracing, as so many others did. But the way that it was done was so haphazard and uh, so contradictory, even in the announcements, that, uh, well, in the state of Kerala, for example, legal objections were raised to the threat to civil liberties from the supposedly mandatory phone app. So public trust in government is crucial to the effective working of uh, the digital systems that are established for counteracting the pandemic. And such trust is based on the perceived trustworthiness of the governments concerned. Furthermore, such trustworthiness must depend on the keeping of commitments, a feature of trust that applies to both interpersonal and institutional contexts. And some governments lost citizen trust for, uh, at, at least for a time during the pandemic. And uh, that, that led to confusing situations. In Mexico, for example, the uh, QR swiping for uh, contact tracing was uh, announced, dis including the fact that it was going to be mandatory. And uh, this led to uh, a previous information commissioner in uh, Mexico uh, suggesting that, that uh, citizens should simply resist this uh, government announcement. But of course, such episodes aren't only a product of the pandemic. They relate as much to longer term shifts in the patterns of governing and especially in the dem democratic def deficit seen in contemporary populism. I'm going to ask you to wrap up a little bit, David. Neoliberal practices and policies. So I I'll come back to some other things later. Let me just conclude by saying there are also specific problems with transparency itself as a goal among those who wish to increase democratic participation in digital times. Someone like David Poznan shows very clearly how easily the word transparency is and can be uh, subverted. He says it's increasingly facilitate, is suspected of facilitating anti-regulatory or neoliberal agendas and of undermining the very values that it's meant to be uh, promoting. Transparency is never a thing in its own right. It's a social process. It's a meaned, means, not an end. It's necessary for accountability and for trust. And there I'll leave it. Much other things we could say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. It's uh, always uh, difficult to compress uh, such a lot of content into such a, a short period of time. And I think it was great to have those uh, specific country examples. It really uh, concretizes uh, nicely the, uh, the, the what's going on around the world. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, Fatu. Uh, she's the uh, Regional Director of Article 19 for West Africa. Um, I, I have known and worked with Fatu uh, since 2002 when she first joined Article 19. Uh, so I know her uh, very well indeed. Um, and uh, she has, uh, well, since that time at least, and perhaps before that, worked uh, a lot on the issue of access to information um, and, and transparency in its wider wider sense um, in Africa, but, but more widely as well. Uh, Fatu, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Toby. I'm very pleased uh, to join this uh, panel, and I would like to thank the organizers, ICIC, for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be, you know, participating alongside all of you, especially Toby, who, with whom uh, I think we've done quite a lot of work on these issues. I'm the, the outgoing director for West Africa for Article 19. I've been working for the organization for the past, as Toby mentioned, 19 years. And um, 
uh, when we look at uh, the issues uh, at hand, access to information, public trust in the times of pandemic, I think we, we uh, would like to interrogate, uh, I think Amy mentioned something very important already. I think the pandemic came at a very, very difficult time already in terms of civic space, in terms of restriction uh, of voices for many reasons. Uh, in our region already, we've seen a lot of uh, setbacks on democratic uh, uh, principles, on human rights, due to many, 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 many aspects, uh, the fight against terrorism, but also uh, the contestation around election has really clouded uh, our space for the past uh, few years. And when the pandemic came, I think many governments use it, I say use it as an opportunity to foster some of these measures and ensure that uh, they tighten further uh, the, the, the space. Uh, as an organization, uh, we've uh, reacted very quickly uh, when the pandemic uh, started in March, precisely. We uh, published, because we've seen across the world, the tendency around hate speech, the tendency of certain governments to quickly take more measures without discussions, without enlightening the public. So we've, uh, and also most importantly, some discrimination against Asian uh, people with uh, of Asian descent. So we quickly uh, publish uh, a briefing highlighting the danger, first of all, of uh, trying to lie around the origin, around also uh, uh, the virus itself and the measures that should be taken. And we call it uh, vi viral lies because and uh, uh, issues around misinformation. And in that briefing, not only we highlighted the danger of hate speech around uh, a com uh, this very difficult time, but also reiterated the importance for governments, civil society and the media particularly, really to ensure that uh, uh, access to information is guaranteed, at least certain number of information that are critical in the fight against COVID-19 are protected. But we've seen what happened. Uh, many governments disregarded their own legislations, disregarded their international obligations and pushed ahead and um, there was a lot of panic around the world, we must, I must say, and I think we all uh, gave government some carte blanche at some stage uh, to legislate, take measures. And that's where we realized that the public trust was broken because governments were given a lot of uh, support across, especially in our region, because everybody thought that they would do the right thing, despite all the challenges that I mentioned before. We've realized that that public trust has been broken, not only many governments didn't do the right thing in terms of using the emergency laws to restrict further expression. We've also seen that in many countries, not only the government restricted those spaces, but they find it very, 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 we find it very strange. They find it despite all the challenges, the difficulties to, you know, get themselves into corrupt practices in terms of the procurement of uh, goods and services, in terms of the distribution of uh, social services to vulnerable communities. And that I think has really, really, when exposed by the media, that has really uh, uh, broken uh, the, the, the public trust and the confidence that many of the citizens had on their government. And we've seen it across the board in few countries where corruption was already one of the, the key things. The other uh, aspect also, we've seen a heightening of uh, intolerance, especially vis-a-vis -vis of the media. We've uh, documented many cases across the region, in Senegal, in Nigeria, in uh, many other countries, where journalists who were trying really to, to report on COVID cases, on, on, on infection, on, on some others, uh, were, 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 were harassed, beaten. And the most disheartening aspect also was that ordinary citizens who at some stage, because of vulnerability, because of poverty, needed to go by, you know, and find a, a living because they they didn't have access to government support. They didn't access to government uh, uh, measures because we all know our system is uh, very based on informal economy. And many people needed to go and there was very, very uh, sad thing that we hear many, in many countries. People will say, I would rather die from COVID than die of hunger. I think that was really a, a, a very poignant message. And across the board, many people were going and we've seen the images across the world where people were beaten in the streets of Senegal, Kenya, Nigeria. Citizens were beaten because they broke COVID rules. Instead of being 
you know, someone instead of being asked to pay fines or just to support it, people were brutalized because they broke COVID. They, they, they finished work late. They had to go buy their business and they were beaten up. And I think those also were some of the scenes that I think broke uh, the, 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 the link between uh, the citizens and, and, their, and, their, and their government. So definitely, I, 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 I do believe that the public trust eroded progressively when government started to take unpopular measures without informing properly the citizens, when government started to take those measures without preparing uh, to provide adequate support for those communities that are vulnerable. And also importantly, when government started, instead of being compassionate, instead of being transparent and supporting communities, when some countries we've seen lots of corruption and that's when people lost hope in, in their government, and I think that is something that also we, we deplore. Uh, in uh, May, also, we issue another briefing because we've seen the tendency how things were going, and we issue another briefing really guiding government, recognizing, of course, that there might be some need to restrict, but we believe that the government must go back to the drawing board and try to adjust their, they, 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 uh, the, the measures they're taking to ensure that they comply with basic human rights and, and provides a set, uh, some kind of information to the public. Some government did, uh, but most of the information were very superficial. We've seen it. Uh, they were not uh, deep enough to uh, enable citizens to understand what government was doing on their behalf. So this is also, um, there was a big missing link. And at the end, at the end, uh, despite all the conspiracy theory which we are seeing today with uh, the low intake of the vaccine, We've seen also that many citizenry at some stage started to think that COVID-19 was not real. And I think that was really the, 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 the tip really of, uh, of, of, of all. So I don't know what uh, I'm left with, but uh, maybe I'll stop at that and uh, maybe get back to some of the other points. Well, thank, thank you so much, Fatu. I think uh, that was a really sobering uh, review of some of the harsher uh, side of the breach of trust with citizens. And uh, uh, we, in the right to information, the access to information movement, we've often talked about the right to information, right to life. Uh, but I think you have uh, painted a very graphic picture of how that really um, is true. Um, I want to uh, now go back and look at, at I think the, the, well, not I think, I mean, it's well documented that the phenomenon of trust in government had been declining well before COVID uh, struck. Um, and uh, that the, the pandemic then sort of impacted on that process. And uh, I mean, starting with you, uh, David, um, Maybe I mean you talked about them a little bit in your in your opening comments, but perhaps um, elaborate a little bit on what were the the key reasons why, um, from a general point of view, but also from a transparency point of view, trust in government had been declining even before uh, we, were, we were hit with this pandemic. Well, I think there were lots of lots of reasons, and it it's, it varies a lot around the world. But I think that one of the factors that just cannot be ignored is the is as i say the ways in which um closer and closer relationships between governments and corporations have developed and how, and then that was accelerated during the pandemic so that uh, governments were looking to corporations to uh, produce all kinds of things from um, vaccines themselves, of course, and through to um, ways of dealing with uh, contact tracing and uh, that whole range of uh, public health issues as well. And, and that, that relationship between government and corporation I think is critical because the kinds of standards and expectations that exist within government and corporation tend to be dissimilar. They're not based on the same kinds of rubrics. And I think there's a basic difficulty that relates to what, what, what I'm calling surveillance capitalism in this context, which is uh, very uh, resistant to transparency. So I think that that's one of the critical issues that we have to confront. And it's something that was already existing, as you say, but uh, very clearly ex accelerating during the pandemic itself. 
So just to push you a little bit on that, though, I mean, arguably, governments have had close relations with corporations, um, I won't say since time immemorial, that could be a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, you know, in our lifetimes, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's not, that itself is not a, a new phenomenon. Um, uh, Perhaps you could, uh, I mean, I think there's something about the digital information space that's somehow impacted on this in a new and different way. And perhaps you could, uh, uh, information capitalism, I think, capitalism well, very it, positively, but yeah. yeah. I think what we're looking at is the reliance on government as every other institution on digital infrastructures. And I think that is the kind of the common factor that we have to consider here because governments are now increasingly dependent upon digital systems that are produced by corporations and they are accepting advice uh, and giving, being given um, unasked for advice from those corporations about how best to organize their situation in order to uh, use the new technologies to the best advantage. So there's a whole new relationship between government and corporations where the platforms especially are creating new ways of operating within government. And so that is what I'm saying was accelerating during the pandemic, uh, suddenly calling upon corporations who were all too willing to uh, offer their services and you know, with very, very different results in different places. And so this, this related uh, especially to the thing that became well known around the world, the idea of digital uh, contact tracing assistance as it were, because contact tracing has always gone on with pandemics, but that's manual and this is digital. And, and, and so there was that whole new set of relationships, but also in the setting up of new, uh, data platforms for public health that did not previously exist that also occurred in a number of different countries and suddenly again you had corporate entities and government departments that were somehow trying to uh, combine their activities and the criteria by which they were combining them who was allowed access to those data how those data were going to be disseminated among the general public what difference it was going to make to have those data uh, all those questions were frequently shrouded in mystery rather than being open and transparent. And I think it's, it's tragic the way that that has happened and how that is now going to be unraveled, I don't know. Yeah, okay, very good points. Uh, I mean, I suppose the, the flip side of that is how we all as individuals have fundamentally different relationships with these uh, companies as well, uh, including in our privacy uh, zone. Um, Amy, you were very, very disciplined and kept to the initial uh, five minutes that I'd ask people to do. And so, I, but you've just published this report. Um, uh, and so I, I, I mean, I'll ask you, you know, during the pandemic, so moving now from sort of pre pre-existing decline in trust, uh, focusing now specifically during the pandemic and, and looking at the interface with transparency. I'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the, the conclusions of the report and what were the specific features of, of transparency or the lack of transparency that um, accelerated the, the decline in trust? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think this is clearly part of a broader democratic decline. Um, we've now observed 15 consecutive years of decline in global freedom. Um, and during this time, authoritarian actors and anti-democratic actors have really been able um, to take key democratic institutions, um, such as the judiciary, um, opposition, uh, the media, and kind of co-opt them in order to advance um, in anti-democratic practices and consolidate power and crack down on dissent. Um, so this also, David mentioned transparency itself can be subverted. And I think this is what has happened um, within this long-term democratic deterioration. Um, and, and before COVID, um, we had been observing in Freedom in the World uh, that disregard for transparency had been declining uh, before that. Um, so, for example, in El Salvador under uh, President Bukele, um, 
a key part of this decline was less government transparency, um, including in topics related to the president's own affairs. Um, so last year he had changed existing access to information legislation in order to give the executive more discretion over the release of records. Um, we've also seen this decline um, in countries that have really um, had some democratic backsliding, like in Poland, um, the government there was able to use opaque and closed practices in order to pass laws without adequate consultation. And this has really aided in the ruling party's consolidation of power and its pandering to their base. Um, so I think this kind of decline in transparency really goes hand in hand with the long-term decline and they're kind of reinforcing each other. Yeah, thanks. I think that's very, very important. At my own organization um, set up, uh, we, we, we have what we call the RTI rating, the right to information rating. So we track all of the countries in the world that have national access to information laws and how strong those laws are. And when the COVID, when the pandemic came along, we added a COVID tracker to that. So tracking the legal changes. But you mentioned in your opening comments, I mean, I think what we saw um, here was a, a, a lot of, uh, in a lot of countries, uh, governments stopped applying their legislation without putting in place, even in emerg in, on an emergency basis, the proper legal tools for that. So they were just breaking their own laws. Uh, and I'm not talking about international human rights standards here, I'm talking about domestic legal regimes. Those don't just stop because of pandemic hits. You can pass emergency legislation, but you have to do that. Right? Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, that was a, you know, wild carding to some extent by governments, not applying the laws, just ignoring laws, you can't do that. Yeah, a lot of the declines that we saw in transparency this past year were related to suspensions of public information laws during emergencies. Um, the problem though is, I'll go back to El Salvador, with the suspension of public information hearings, this prevented people from accessing critical information that they needed about the pandemic and their own health and health records. Um, and then similarly, um, in Spain, there was also a suspension of public information requests. Um, and so, yeah, this has been seen all over. And I think it's really contributed to this decline in trust um, during during this past year. Yeah, I think that's I think that's very serious. Uh, I, I would mention a counterexample here. Uh, in Argentina, they pass general legislation suspending administrative processes, so you know everything, uh, and then they give the power to the sector bodies uh, to uh, you know adjust that or uh, fine tune it or whatever it was. Um, and the uh, Argentinian Information Commissioner, so one of the members of the ICIC, uh, uh, said, well, no, this right that is not going to be suspended and this administrative practice. And because they had allocated, sub allocated, if you will, the power to the oversight bodies to do that, he restored the access to information process and reimpose the obligation on governments to respond to requests. So I think it was a wonderful example. Uh, and of course, in Brazil, the Supreme Court um, uh, also ended the suspension of uh, RTI saying it's a human right on the country. Um, Fatou, I think you made a really interesting comment in your opening remarks about how we kind of um, allocated too much trust to government. So almost the counter of what the main theme here is to do the right thing and to you know, have a free hand. If I understood your comment correctly, uh, you know, citizens sort of said, okay, government, you know, we're in a mess here. Go and deal with it. We'll let you do that. Um, could you unpack that a little bit more? Because that sort of, I mean, I agree with that, but it sort of runs a little counter to the other concept of trust, maybe the deeper sense of trust that we're talking about here as well. It's sort of this, we gave them license, but on the same at the same time, somehow we didn't trust them or we trusted them less. It seems like not not a contradiction, but a tension. Mm. Okay, I think uh, uh, what happened in most countries, and I will maybe give two examples. Uh, as you know, there have been tensions, especially in some of these countries between opposition and government, and uh, uh, for many reasons. Uh, but uh, when the COVID-19 started, uh, this, uh, they, we, we realized that people, for some reason, due to pressure, of course, but uh, due to the fact that people just wanted to show that they all work together. Uh, many, even radical opposition, decided to work with the government. 
which is quite very rare because, you know, in most countries, they don't have a lot of culture of bipartisan, except maybe one or two where they have two big parties. Generally, there is always tension between opposition and civil society and government. So for some reason, for example, in Senegal here, uh, the, the president just called on everybody to come together, hands on deck to work and uh, call on key leaders of civil society at meetings uh, with all opposition leaders. And they all uh, converged, they agreed. And uh, so it was quite a, an important moment. And we've seen the same thing in South Africa when all opposition in group individually, they all came and, and discussed with the government on how really, and I think it was quite an important moment for most of these countries to see like uh, people in unison coming to try and tackle. Probably it has some impact on maybe how we manage across the board to, to reduce the numbers in some countries. I'm not sure uh, that uh, research will let us know. But for some reason, uh, government started to, to, to unfold its plans without consulting a lot of people. Uh, they, they, they got a lot of uh, 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 resources from international uh, institutions such as the IMF using uh, uh, Les Droits de Tirage. Uh, they, 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 they took a lot of their uh, uh, resources, uh, I guess, uh, 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 from those institutions. And those are quite heavy uh, 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 kind of uh, mechanisms. And we realized that, you know, billions have been uh, sourced out from those institutions, which will have implication in the long run for the future of those, these countries because these are not free monies. Of course, they are taking from their own reserves. They are taking from different sources really to tackle the pandemic. Uh, but what people have seen in, uh, in by way of providing those public services, they have not been transparent. They, there have been a lot of allegations of corruption and most governments have just been quiet and there have been allegation or, you know, directed to people who are very close to, you know, decision, decision makers. So that also casted a lot of doubt and a lot of this mistrust started to, to be seen. The other bit was the harsh. When people went really uh, for little mistakes, for maybe some little resistance from young people who were fed up, who didn't know how to, you know, manage the situation due to poverty in the areas, instead of, you know, uh, mechanisms uh, for help to help them to cope, to counsel them, to 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 dissuade them from going out. They were beaten. They were they were really brutalized. And I think that also you know uh, brought some some anger. And uh, I think uh, you see that it, uh, it 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 build up until we've seen what happened in Nigeria with uh, with the different uh, the different violence movement. I think uh, due to the COVID, we've seen in countries. Also, that were under election, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea. We've seen people trying really to break the rules and go because they were fed up, because of the lockdowns were not reasonable. Government were not coming forward with reasonable measures, and the population were not supported. So that's why I'm saying that they were given carte blanche. They've been supported, but in return, people realized that they didn't see anything, uh, you know, coming from government that was really in their favor in terms of, you know. Uh, try to make them understand and, and also alleviating their, their sufferance in terms of the poverty, in terms of uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, the deprivation of their liberties. Because when people sit in their homes without knowing what will they put on the table in the evening, I think uh, it's very difficult for people to, and also because of the informal sectors they are working in, they don't have any, any resources and government uh, doesn't provide direct resources to them. So I think these were the these these are the things that I I wanted to mention. But maybe what Amy mentioned also about the space uh, and the decline over the over more than a decade. I think also election and the fact that most of the these countries who were really progressing, if you can see in their own report and even uh, with uh, the different uh, uh, research that has been conducted by by some of the organization, including ourselves, uh, you've seen that election has become a tension in the region, not due to the fact that the results were rigged, uh, the fairness, but due to the fact that the rules have been slightly changed more and more. Governments who've decided, or president who decided that they will stay for two terms, for some reason decide, will decide to change the constitution. Uh, 
and to stay forever or to extend their 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 their, their stay without any consensus. And also uh, at the last minute before election, we've seen also election rules change. Another one is exclusion. There are many rule laws also that have been enacted in different countries to exclude political opponent. In Benin, we've seen it with the parrainage where you would exclude a big part of the political class from contesting due to, you know, uh, different rules that are not fair. So I think all those things have also created uh, a situation of uh, restriction that uh, will that has been a fertile ground for for what happened last year and this year. I think the, the the theme of governments taking political advantage of the situation, uh, I mentioned it very briefly in my opening comments, Amy uh, talked uh, about it, and now you've, you've talked about it as well. That's why I think that that uh, is um, one of the most unfortunate, well, uh, perhaps not most unfortunate, but one of the significant unfortunate features of this whole uh, situation, and also uh, very, very much uh, you know, conducive to, to eroding trust in government. Because, uh, but by, by the same token that we kind of gave government license, um, I, I, I wonder if Amy or, or, or David or, or both want to comment a little bit on that. Because I think it is true that we, you know, we felt a need for government to do something to save us, uh, so we extended them some license, which is a form of trust. Uh, but then, on the other hand, uh, perhaps in deeper ways. Um, uh, maybe over the longer term, by the way, I think that you described, you know, initially you gave the trust, but then when they started abusing it, uh, that trust disappeared. But are there different levels of trust that are operating here? Anyone? Well, I can step in with an example, if you like. Um, the, the business of governments uh, taking advantage of a situation. If you think of the case of uh, Israel, with uh, their... Um, contact tracing um, program that was actually put in the hands of Shin Bet, which is the uh, security agency, uh, which is uh, normally and has been built around dealing with uh, terrorism. And therefore, um, you, you, you suddenly had the uh, public health agency connected with the uh, security agency. And, and that was highly problematic. And uh, it was done with very little transparency, actually in an overnight cabinet meeting. And uh, it, it was just a, a fait accompli that was announced. So that was kind of the, the bad news. The good news was that uh, the challenge to that went to the Supreme Court and the Sup Supreme Court in the end uh, managed to have a um, a sunset put on that uh, scheme, and uh, the th that 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 came and went. But then there's bad news that follows the good news, which is that during protests on uh, against the evictions in uh, Sheikh Jarrah that have been dominating headlines for the last couple of weeks, um, some of those who were protesting looked at their phones to discover that they were getting messages that were almost identical to the messages relating to contact tracing, saying your presence at the protest has been noted, uh, Israeli intelligence. So it appeared that the very system that was set up under those circumstances, brought down by the Supreme Court, uh, had somehow, no one had ever seen anything like that before, had somehow reappeared in the context of the uh, Sheikh Jarrah protests. And th that connects to a larger problem too, which is that the, the question of, are there sunset clauses on some of these systems that have been set up for pandemic purposes? Are they going to be taken down or are we to assume that the kinds of rather untransparent data collection analysis and use that began during the pandemic will continue after the pandemic. So I don't think it's only a question of, you know, we had certain issues before the pandemic and they have been, they may have been uh, accelerated or exaggerated or amplified during the pandemic. It's also a question of how many of these are going to be continuing afterwards. And that is a critical question for transparency down the road, it seems to me.
Absolutely. One of one of the points. I mean, as I mentioned in my opening comments, our position from the beginning was that access to information legislation should not be suspended; it needs to be maintained. It was an essential service. But if you did suspend it, as many countries did, whether legally or illegally, just in practice, uh, at least you needed to re restore it as quickly as possible and move to, and back into our, our new normal. But we can raise another point, which which I mean, we've sort of been talking about declines in trust, but there are aspects of the pandemic which require us to have greater trust in government. Uh, I have the contract tracing app on my phone. Uh, you know, it, it's going to tell me if I've been in a hot spot for too long and then I need to go and get tested and whatever. Uh, and I, 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 I do that in trust that it is privacy protected. Uh, I hope that trust is warranted. Um, I wouldn't normally uh, do something like that. Uh, so, I mean, a sort of collective action against the pandemic probably does uh, require and a greater trust. Um, I, I, on, on that, I'm going to move on to a, another set of questions. So, um, uh, we we an important uh, the underlying assumption here um, is that uh, increasing transparency. So we we've, we've suffered from declines in transparency, and we've seen corresponding declines or consequent declines in trust. But increasing, bolstering, building back transparency uh, uh, should restore trust. Firstly, is that true? Um, and secondly, uh, what kinds of priority measures uh, should governments be taking uh, in that space? And I'm going to push that uh, first to you, Amy. I think that, um, yeah, increased transparency definitely can restore and bolster trust. Um, if people aren't able to get information about what the state is doing or even petition governments for this information. If they're not able to contribute to consultations on proposed policies or legislations, if they can't access um, uh, access and scrutinize government contracts that are awarded with little transparency or competition, all of these components will erode trust. So. I think it's key to make room for public consultations and scrutin scrutiny, um, because without this, a really key area of democracy is diminished. And this, of course, can have knock on effects that will further erode the strength of democratic institutions. Um, we really need to keep working at this and revitalizing all the different components of a democracy because it's not an end point, it needs continuous progress. Um, and I think a key part of this is making sure that officials and other powerful actors can be held to account. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a lifelong campaigner for transparency and I certainly believe everything you said. What I'm not, uh, I guess, not quite sure about is once you've lost trust, right, so we should be transparent so as not to lose trust, but once you've lost trust, um, how easy, easy is it to get it back? And I mean, perhaps we need a psychiatrist on the panel uh, uh, to answer or answer that. Um, um, and uh, uh, I mean, um, Patu, uh, you know, once we reach our new normal, uh, and I mean, I, I, you know, I'm saying that in quotation marks because uh, you know, even here in Canada, where we uh, you know, are moving well in terms of vaccinations. Uh, we still don't really have a clear idea, any clear idea, I would say, of what that's going to look like. But anyway, um, uh, what would you uh, say are some of the practical measures, including in developing uh, contexts, uh, to bolster transparency? What are the you know, first practical things that governments can do? Uh, Amy mentioned some ideas, consultations, and things like that, but. Uh, as you look around the countries around you, what, what would your advice be? To? Yeah, I think uh, it's difficult, as like you say, when uh, that is uh, broken to to come back to normalcy. But I do believe that uh, depoliticization, because I think the pandemic across the board has been politicized. And once it is politicized and the response politicized, especially when you have positive uh, results, like we've seen it in our places. There was a time, for example, when Senegal was one of those countries that uh, was uh, identified across the world as one of the countries that really dealt very well with, I think it was about second, you know, according to some statistics, 
and that uh, you know uh, was very important for the whole country, for the ego, for for everything. After New Zealand, I think that was there was a time when it was said that Senegal managed very well. But and uh, you you've seen uh, uh, politicians trying, and it was a collective effort. As I mentioned, everybody sacrificed. Young people created apps. Uh, civil society supported. They left their programs to go sensitize. The media lost a lot of resources, which I don't think they ever recovered. They got some subsidies here and there. But most of the media houses almost stopped their key programs to sensitize and to link up with government programs so that they sensitize. But when you see sometimes the result, government try to capitalize for political gains. And the other bit that also we've noticed is that uh, the support, especially the food aid, is very critical, it's very sensitive. It touches to, you know, on, on human dignity. And we've seen, instead of giving, you know, all the ways, uh, you know, other means, they, they prefer to have all these big tons of, uh, you know, food aid uh, that to, to be presented to the population. And I think that created a lot of frustration because many people didn't get their, their share and uh, they, were, they could have done it differently because humanitarian assistance is done quite differently these days. But some government decided to buy food aid and distribute themselves, and that also just to, to, to capitalize politically on it. So I think all those mistakes, missteps that have been made, if we learn from, if they learn from and uh, detach the politician or the day-to-day -day political life with uh, and leave the scientists to, to deal with. And I also think uh, a way forward, and we've learned it during the COVID, uh, they promised most of these countries to invest further on health. And I think one of the big lessons learned that when COVID came, we realized that the health systems were really down. Nothing was happening. They, all the resources now that were brought forward, as I mentioned, they got this droit de tirage from IMF. They took lots of money to mitigate the challenges and uh, face the situation. And we are yet to see that uh, they will invest in the health sector and prepare for maybe a fourth wave for certain countries, but also build uh, their resilience for, for the future. So I do believe uh, uh, we've learned quite a lot in terms of bringing people when it matters. But I believe that if you want to consolidate and use it maybe to build co other consensus for other issues, you need to be trustworthy and you should also have some some kind of rules so that uh, when people give you their trust, especially in difficult situations, you don't break it. But also when you deal with vulnerable communities, despite all their challenges, you need to play by the rules and you cannot uh, use this difficult situation to try and score political game. And lastly, uh, the, the, the public services uh, need to be overhauled. And COVID has shown us that all the investment they mentioned, all the things that they've said they've invested, when COVID arrived, there is nothing. And now we are seeing it with the vaccines. We are depending on hands out. Few countries are able to buy vaccines, which in itself is quite a major public uh, health disaster. Yeah, very, very good points. Uh, <clears throat> of course, the whole transparency around uh, COVID um, contracts and the price that, that's being paid and all this, the terms of these contracts and things, which is a huge, in most countries, an absolute, you know, secrecy zone uh, just uh, chatting this morning by email with some people who want to launch uh, constitutional challenges uh, around those issues and i think it's very important i, I think just on the, on the public the political side of things i mean several of us uh, decried the you know crass and negative politicking around it um for for just you know, taking advantage if, if you will but i suppose uh, let's call it normal politicking around covid is, i mean you know it's the, it, it's the event that's taking place in our lives right now, or the most important one. It's it's impossible to avoid some degree of politicization. Uh, perhaps there's a, a level at which it becomes negative. I don't know, um, but but I mean, it's you know, it's not possible to for politicians not to somehow you know, say we did a good job, but try to get political points for that or whatever. Um, but David, I'm going to shift a little bit, David, and I hope you're uh, you know, ready for this slightly difficult question. We, we've been talking about the transparency boosting trust. Can transparency also erode trust? And if so, 
what do we need to think about as we advocate for transparency and hopefully experience some successes in terms of increasing transparency that we don't need to that result. That and you said that the transparency is not a goal in itself, it's or something, and we certainly don't want it to have a negative one. So are you addressing that to me, Toby, or? I, I, well, I'm, I'm kind of pushing it towards you if you're, if you're okay. ready to take it, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the, there, there are so many questions around transparency. It's a good single word to indicate um, the, the idea that what is seen is, or what is done is out in the open, that it, we, we can see what has happened and we can then discuss it. Uh, we can understand what law has been passed, the meaning of this new technology, whatever it is, it becomes more transparent. And that transparency uh, is generally thought of as a good thing. Um, and there are certain circumstances perhaps when transparency is less appropriate, but it's generally seen as a good thing. I mean, in the... Uh, surveillance world in which I operate, or rather in that I try to understand, there's also the question of how ordinary citizens and ordinary consumers are made transparent. And so immediately there's, there's a confusion there because um, I am so transparent to so many other people, agencies, and so on and so forth about which I know nothing. And uh, at the same time, those agencies are frequently, or platform companies, whatever they are, government departments, they are far from transparent to me. So there's a there's a mismatch there. So that's a, that's another aspect of the whole question. We use the same word, transparency, to describe um, how our own lives are made visible. This is what surveillance does. It makes us visible to others, whether commercial, uh, corporate, or governmental, or other kinds of agencies. And, but it doesn't only make us visible. It also represents us then in particular ways. And more than that, on the basis of that rep representation, we're treated in different ways. And so there are, as I said before, uh, you know, life chances that are involved here. So I think that's really important when we're thinking about what transparency might be, because in the case of um, data, and most of the time, as I say, we're talking about data these days when it comes to both government and corporations. So it's really important to consider what is actually happening with transparency, what might be uh, being made transparent, and what is deliberately not held to be transparent. Um, so I think I think that that's a that's a starting point for thinking about the word. And yes, of course, it can be uh, easily subverted. And that's why I stress that transparency in the case of uh, government departments and corporations should be thought of in terms of a means to obtaining accountability. That is to say, accountability to the people who are, uh, to whom those agencies are responsible, whether it's citizens or consumers or uh, whatever. So the idea that uh, there can be a means of achieving accountability, I think is, is, is excellent. And then you come into other rather more abstract notions like, like trust. I mean, accountability, you can, you can connect to laws or regulations and so on. But trust is utterly critical to all our relationships in any given society, but it is so abstract and so difficult to define exactly what that trust might be. But you and I all know what we mean by it when it comes to our actual relationships with others. So that's that's the begin the way that I would begin to frame it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's, I think it's, I think it's probably think it's important, important to um, um think, I mean we 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 recognize we, 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 we recognize that there are limits to transparency you know, under international law. Um the limits of free speech and the limits to access to transparency. Uh, but but also there may be within the long limited form of transparency maybe ways in which we can undermine I have a couple of questions um, uh, from uh, the, the, the channels. Um, 
And, and one uh, for you, Fatou. Yara from Brazil is asking whether uh, young people in Senegal are interested in the issue of transparency and uh, if you have some ideas about how to engage young people in that issue. Yeah, only specific on the pandemic huh? or in transparency in general. I think it is interested in transparency more generally. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, for the past uh, two decades, I think we've seen uh, uh, quite a lot of involvement of young people, especially in the digital space, on different processes so from uh, election, from uh, uh, different other uh, issues around uh, transparency and uh, extractive industries, issues around human rights. We've seen uh, many young people getting interested and organizing. Not only they're interested individually, but they are organized. Uh, you've seen uh, like a very important platform. In Senegal, there is a hashtag which has been there forever, which means discussion, which is called Kebetu. I think it's one of those most popular across Africa. It was created uh, uh, during the first alternance. And uh, anything that is about public issues, public debate, uh, is, 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 is there. And young people are quite active in, in those pairs. Uh, in regards to elections also, they lead, they organize election transparency, uh, they localize it, use local languages to mobilize, ensure that uh, not only they monitor, but also they provide information on, on voters' registration on different aspects. But on this specific one also, I think they led, they led the way at some stage by setting up uh, uh, some platform to inform people and also to help people understand what the pandemic was, what it was not, to help also dissipate some of the, the misinformation and help people also to orientate them where they should get uh, the right information. And they work quite well. Uh, normally, they are quite radical. Uh, they, they, they challenge a lot what the government does. But on this one, they really, really supported government uh, to help people also to get information, know where they should go when they needed to be tested. And I think they are quite, they're quite amazing, uh, especially those in, in, the, in the digital and in Senegal, they have a culture of activism, as you can, you know, uh, through the radios, through community media, especially also. But again, uh, uh, with the civic space restrictions across the region, there are a lot of challenges uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, civic engagement. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, obviously, in, in some sense, the future of uh, transparency depends on young people's engagement. And I guess I'm a little worried about that because um, uh, by, by, in, in many of the countries that I work in, as you know, it, it, it's all, uh, don't as much engagement by young people as, as it, would, it would be nice to see. Second question, which is for you, David. Um, and uh, I mean, to, it's, it's, it's a longer question, but to, to really summarize it, um, uh, looking at the issue of surveillance, uh, which coming both from uh, state agencies but also from private companies, uh, we talked about eloquently. Um, and the question is: Do you think in the past few years the general public has become a little bit more aware of that as a as a problem, and um, that maybe are you know, kind of um, engaging more and? Building ahead of steam, I'm adding to the question now, but building ahead of steam that may be real with the regular system effectively. Yeah, you're, you're breaking up a little bit, Toby. I'm not quite sure why, but I, I, I get the gist. Um, so, questions about normalization and the, the ways in which people begin to get used to certain kinds of uh, surveillance activities. Is that what you're asking about? Yes. Well, I think the question was that people have sort of, you know, became uh, acclimatized to the idea of surveillance, but maybe in the last few years with some of the um, exposure of the problems from it, maybe they're getting a little bit more aware of it as a problem and more active. On it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think there is um, a growing interest and, and having followed some you know, civil society activities in other countries around the world, apart from Canada, I see that that is that is occurring, and it frequently occur occurs through people um, seeing things online. 
or uh, you know watching a documentary like Social Dilemma or uh, seeing and being terrified by Black Mirror. I mean, those are the kinds of things that uh, raise people's awareness because they do speak to the very issues that they're confronting in, in everyday life. Um, I'm not sure quite how far this relates to transparency and, and transparency issues. And certainly, uh, as we've said before, anyone who is uh, adopting or introducing some new system does need to maintain that transparency. I said a few minutes ago that the um, the notion of, of, of trust is, is very uh, abstract. There's a sense that it is, but you can also tie things down a bit by thinking about trustworthiness. What makes someone uh, or a, a government body appear to be more trustworthy is a question about how they how the trust is actually mobilized. And I think in you know, in the situations we've been talking about this morning, there are countries like um, New Zealand and uh, Taiwan, where in both cases during the pandemic, there was a fairly high level of trust and uh, the kinds of um, systems that were being presented to people were being presented in a way that connected with others in real life and particularly civil society in the case of Taiwan, where there was a lot of involvement by civil society in the actual production of the various new entities that were technological entities that were being introduced to try to uh, work against the virus. And so, you know, that those that kind of awareness is seen in contexts like that also in, in uh, New Zealand. Um, and actually in Brazil too, there, there may have been some uh, rather unfortunate uh, announcements from uh, President uh, Bolsonaro, but I do think that the activities of on the ground civil society has been very conducive to uh, quite different approaches that were also in themselves transparent and, and aiming to try to increase uh, popular knowledge and understanding of what was going on in a way that was actually being uh, limited by the powers that be. So I, th I think the question of how people become aware of these things is a, is, is, a, is a very big one, but I think it's a critical one that we should be answering uh, or addressing rather at this time, because these are the issues about transparency and trust that we're gonna be looking at even more after this pandemic. Yeah, no, and yeah, I, no, I, 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 I'm not sure I'm coming, not sure I'm coming, coming back to myself back. with my, my channel, but um, I think that the issue of trust is also very cultural. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. About that, and I mean, for example, uh, there was a lot of trust in New Zealand, and New Zealand was successful in addressing uh, the pandemic, but they did that in part by uh, forcibly locking you down when you arrived from abroad. Uh, which is something that I think Canadians uh, and, and certainly yeah. will find very, very difficult to accept and would not have generated, not have been accepted and not have generated trust here. So I you can see that might not have worked other contexts. Um, we're, 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 I'm, I'm just conscious of the time moving along and I, I also of the fact that the, this uh, this webinar is being hosted by the ICIC, the International Conference of Information Commissioners, and obviously their uh, main task is to oversee uh, the implementation of access to information, or as I uh, call it, right to information legislation. So I want to focus a little bit uh, on that particular issue. Um, and uh, a little while ago, uh, David, you sort of said transparency, you know, it's a very broad camp, there's all kinds of uh, tools and ways in which uh, transparency is delivered, and that's true. Um, and one of them is uh, right to information legislation. Um, so focusing on that, uh, uh, Amy, uh, and you've already made a few comments about this, but um, um, it, you know, as part of the broader transparency phenomenon in COVID times, or in the pandemic times, how important uh, was the right to information and how um, comparatively uh, heavily was it impacted, uh, negatively impacted uh, by the pandemic compared to other uh, forms of transparency. And I'm going to uh, extract from that, I mean, there was the sort of proactive disclosure. I think a lot of countries actually did fairly well in pushing out basic information about uh, you know, 
facts on the on the pandemic and its trajectory and, and whatever. But uh, in terms of the request driven side, which was obviously much more heavily. Yeah, um, I think a big part of the decline in transparency uh, was the suspension of right to information or access to information requests and fulfilling those. Um, and this came at a, this was at a really bad time because there is this pandemic and governments were able to enact states of emergency and pass legislation that was fast tracked and may have didn't have the same level of scrutiny necessarily. So these type, this type of legislation is really crucial for holding abusive actors to account. Um, and I think kind of hand in hand, uh, there, we also saw a really significant decline in media freedom and the media is key also to shedding light on government overreach and other abuses of power. Um, and I think also that going back to the trust issue and whether, um, whether uh, transparency leads to trust, I think sometimes the source might matter. So if you're looking at a government and what their information, what they're sharing, um, if it's coming from, you know, an executive who may have abolished term limits to keep himself in office, that might not, not necessarily foster the same level of trust as what you're hearing from an independent news outlet or from a trusted civil society organization. And I think right to information requests go hand in hand because um, independent actors like the media and civil society can really make use of those to put out the necessary information that we need, especially during a really critical time like a pandemic. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's absolutely true. And I mean, you, you, you're sort of faced with this double tsunami of, on the one hand, um, our governments were making absolutely unprecedented decisions. and. When you sort of said abusive behavior by government, but just regular behavior by government, they were spending vast amounts of money in you know point blank period of time. Uh, you know that such we've never seen anything like that before. They were suspending our basic civil rights. Uh, you know, our human rights were being suspended. That, that doesn't happen in countries like Canada. Uh, and on my, but in most of Canada, we had no suspension of human rights since the, the Second World War. I mean, before I was long before I was born. Um, and, you know, it, it, was, it was truly unprecedented, the types of decisions that were being made. And yet, as you said, uh, many of our normal accountability mechanisms were just not in play. Uh, you know, parliaments were suspended um, or, or, or severely hobbled, uh, you know, par horizontal accountability mechanisms. And so I think it was you know, the potential for, for access to information or the right to information. On the other hand, of course, the right to information also depends on uh, other forms of accountability mechanisms, ultimately the courts, uh, to, to enforce the enforce rules. Um, okay, as we get into the, the last uh, few minutes of our panel, which I have to say I think has been a really great discussion, um, I want to uh, try to um, move a little bit more onto a positive outlook. Um, are, are, is there a silver lining here? Are we going to see some positive things? And, and uh, I mean, Patu, let me put you on the spot a little bit. You, you talked about promises about improving health care. Um, I mean, even, even the fact that the pandemic has brought to the fore the weaknesses in the healthcare systems and therefore popularized that sort of the transparency phenomenon of, of a sort. Um, in the minds of the public will create political pressure for that, whether it will get delivered. I mean, might we see uh, uh, something in that in that line, um, which which again, it, you know, which I would see is essentially as true or some, I mean, it's not a it's not transparency in the way we normally think of it, but you know, the public being aware of things and David's broad definition of transparency falls within that, I think, uh, people being aware of things that are going on around them. Um, would there be some positive benefits in terms of the, you know, bolstering of services and particularly probably help? Well, I think uh, the response will be maybe mixed. We are cautious. Uh, we are optimistic in some regards because people are more and more aware. They are more and more, and more interested in the functioning of uh, public services than, than before. Uh, and I think uh, it's very important to note that uh, uh, what they have been announcing, I just uh, give an example of Ghana. Uh, 
uh, Senegal also, when the situation got, uh, even Gambia, in fact, when the situation got really scary, all the countries, especially Ghana, announced that they're going to build like a big uh, world-class hospital. And uh, recently, when we do the when we did the fact check, no work started. They receive also uh, in Senegal. The president announced that uh, uh, he requested for a new deal, a new plan for investment in the health sector. Uh, it was last year, I think, uh, before the second wave. Until today, also we are not sure where that big plan for restructuring, reinvesting in the health sector is. Uh, in the Gambia, the situation is really even got worse. Uh, they have also received a lot of resources, a lot of support. Uh, we've not seen anything built or anything uh, re refurbished. So they, they, except maybe a very, very tiny uh, private sector led uh, a unit that was uh, uh, restored, restored from a small hospital, I think uh, to a dozen of a bed to, to, to support. Uh, just to say that the public is aware and maybe ironically, many people now have been saying because of the COVID and the travel restrictions, all those leaders will be more conscious because they know that when they have COVID, they will have to stay here. When they have other, other disease, they have to stay around. Maybe that could trigger some patriotism, some interest in investing. in the, But they have been uh, shuttled in and out through private jets, some of them, uh, through, uh, how to call it, safe conduit to go to Europe and still continue their treatment. So I do believe there is hope because people are aware uh, it's not going to be like before. But again, one thing for sure, uh, the world has changed uh, and the region has changed dramatically. So we don't know really, we are quite concerned. We don't know if people will still have the strength to fight again because uh, it's not part of this discussion, but because most of the countries now discover oil, gas and other natural resources and the power dynamics have changed and the interest in human rights will be changing and those who used to support human rights have less interest in uh, talking about human rights because they're all fighting to get some of the businesses for their companies. So again, uh, it's going to be, post-COVID will be very difficult for our countries because of the, the bigger stakes in terms of uh, uh, some of those natural resources that have to be shared uh, by big companies. So I guess human rights will be secondary to many people. Hence the importance of such so initiative. And I have a cup. I'm going to just lay out a couple of questions uh, from the from the floor because or from the the, the audience, uh, and then uh, combine that with my question: What is there a silver lining? Uh, and, and last words by uh, David. So uh, uh, um, somebody uh, probably from Indonesia has asked: Is there a relationship between trust and the gravity of the pandemic? In other words where countries dealt with the pandemic more successfully, that was trust higher, well, perhaps New Zealand is an example of that. And then another one about media and information literacy, um, and there's a lot of efforts going on, could they be coordinated better? So uh, three questions in one minute each for uh, first David and then uh, So the, the, the question that, that I'm hearing has to do with the, uh, the, the future and the and, and what sorts of things are going to be happening next is that right yeah yeah okay um i i agree with fatu that um uh, the situations that we're talking about are always mixed and I, there's there's an, and and you you commented on the uh alternative interpretation of what had gone on in in new zealand during the pandemic and these situations are always mixed and i think we need to acknowledge that it's all very messy and uh, yet there are opportunities for us to think through the issues in a larger context. And I think that the pandemic actually does give us real opportunities. Of course, there are opportunistic governments and opportunistic corporations that have taken advantage of the pandemic in very negative ways. And we're going to have to struggle with those. But at the same time, it is also an opportunity for us to actually be considering in depth these kinds of issues that we've been talking about just now. And that seems to me to be a, a really 
important thing. I mean, Arundhati Roy talked about the uh, pandemic being a portal. And what was the stuff that we're going to take through that portal? Are we going to take through that portal, the old normal that we've already agreed this morning was a pretty, it was crappy in some key ways in relation to things like transparency, trust, accountability, and so on. Do we want to walk through the portal that the uh, pandemic offers us with the old nonsense from the, uh, from the old normal? So I think the pandemic does offer us opportunities, and I do think that we're already seeing those kinds of conversations occurring now between people who have been forced to be together. I mean, we talk about distancing all the time, but actually people in many ways have been forced together and forced to confront issues together in new ways. So I think that there are new opportunities and that it is worth our while to pursue them at this moment. Well, that's a that's a lovely a lovely metaphor. Um, and uh, uh, Amy, uh, last uh, last word uh, for you. Yeah, I echoing what Fatu and David said um, so eloquently. I think COVID does present a real opportunity. Um, it really shined a light on a lot of issues that societies were already facing. We saw this with you know excessive police abuse in enforcing lockdown measures and how marginalized communities in societies were more prominently affected by the pandemic and the responses to it. Um, so I think recognizing that this is this could be a great time to rethink previous approaches that have been taken. Um, the pandemic has really created a new normal and caused lasting changes um, around the world. So this is a an opportune time to craft policies and legislation and involve uh, civil society and uh, other non-governmental actors who can um, really work to address some of these, the inequalities that we've seen and the abuses that we've seen um, and um, enact real lasting change. Uh, whether this actually happens is a question. Um, I'm not sure, I might be being too optimistic here, but I think it does present a really good opportunity. Well, okay, that's that's good. I, I, first of all, I'd like to end by really thanking uh, the panelists. Um, uh, they know, but the audience doesn't know that I, uh, I really pressed them that we should have an interactive, uh, free-flowing conversation. And I think we really achieved that. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so I really thank you all for, for engaging and uh, uh, sort of being light and imaginative and wide ranging uh, and things and I also I think it's nice to end on a positive note I, I, I am I am an optimist at heart um, I think that there are some positive things that we will we will draw from this I, I really love uh, uh, that down with the uh, Roy uh, metaphor about the portal and how we're going to carry our ridiculous baggage from before and hopefully we can carry some of the good things from before because not everything was bad before um, and uh, I, I think that would be great. I, I think one of the very concrete ways that the pandemic has advanced this is in terms of our engagement with technology. Um, and, you know, we're, um, I had an interaction with a, a church and they upgraded their um, whole um, you know, um, Wi-Fi system uh, so that they could stream stuff, you know, and it was the pandemic that pushed them to do that, even though they might well have thought of streaming things before, um, you know, for people who couldn't get to the church or whatever it was. So, um, you know, I think that those kinds of uh, benefits um, and hopefully some of the more profound. Uh, and I, I think, you know, we have kicked off the 12th uh, International Conference of the Information Commissioners. I hope that we've done so uh, in a good fashion and that the audience will come back for the second, third, fourth, and so on uh, webinars. And uh, thank you all again for your excellent. Thank you. Thank you.